is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. You know, when I make these videos, all I do is play Kerbal Space Program the way I normally do, and then as after I've done a few missions, I sort of look at them and see if there's a, a kind of common theme that emerges, something that sort of can link them all together that I can talk about. And this one, with the few missions that are coming up here, the common theme that came up was orbital maneuvering. Now, I've been, I've been doing lots of orbital maneuvering. You can't play Kerbal Space Program without going into orbital maneuvering. But a few th situations came up in this one, one or two situations, that a um, little bit different, a little bit unique, uh, going from uh, an elliptical orbit, a high eccentricity orbit, into a circular orbit and trying to rendezvous with something into that circular orbit and trying to do that efficiently, as well as going from a hyperbolic trajectory into a circular orbit, but not only just getting into the orbit, but also getting into a specific position within the orbit. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But we're going to start off with, as uh, Glafia here finishes uh, taking some ports, parts off of the Corian and sticking them onto the space station, just to sort of shed a little bit of mass that we don't need anymore, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Corian on its next mission. Um, so we're going to disconnect from the station. We've now fueled up the Corian. It is ready to go. Uh, we're going to use a little RCS just to sort of back off a little bit. There we go. That ought to do it. And the mission here is the rendezvous with ComSat-1. Now, if you've forgotten about ComSat-1, I don't blame you. It has been in space for 86 days. I launched it way back in episode 13 of this particular series. And it was going to be my first communication satellite, but it never quite made it to its orbit. It ran out of fuel before it got there. There's ComSat-1. So we're going to set it as a target. And what we want to do is we want to rendezvous with it. Because the other, uh, the other communication satellites are doing fine without ComSat-1. ComSat-1 is adding nothing whatsoever. So we're going to make something useful out of it by uh, joining up with it with the Corian, fueling it up, and sending it over to the moon where it'll act as a communication satellite there. So what we got to do is we got to do a transfer up to the moon. This is my normal standard transfer. And by the way, or not to the moon, I'm sorry, to ComSat-1. And this type of a transfer, by the way, has a name. It's called a Holman transfer. These sort of standard transfers that you do, where you burn prograde to raise your apoapsis up to the altitude that you want. And then once you get up to apoapsis, you burn prograde once again to raise your periapsis up to altitude. That's called a Holman transfer. It's the standard uh, orbital transfer that we've done over and over again. The only added Bit here is that I'm also rendezvousing with ComSat-1 at the same time, but of course, you've seen me do that so many times before, uh, I don't think I need to elaborate upon that any more than I already have. Alright, so Jeb is just finishing off, bringing his relative, velo relative velocity down to zero, and we're happy with that, so we're going to send out Glafia once again. She's going to use the KAS uh, pipe endpoints to connect the Corian to ComSat-1. Uh, and then what we're going to do is transfer over some fuel. And, you know, the, the tank on ComSat-1 is so small that I, I'm just going to fill it right up. Corian will barely miss that amount of fuel. And uh, once it's filled up, it's time to send each of these vessels back their separate ways. Starting off with the Corian, which is going to burn retrograde to lower its periapsis down into Kerbin's atmosphere. I'm once again using the Trajectories mod to predict the path that's going to happen after the arrow braking maneuver. And once again, I'm keeping my uh, predicted G forces uh, no more than 0.2 of a G. I could probably push it a little bit harder than that, but I've done several air braking passes now with 0.2 of a G and everything's gone fine. I don't see any reason to push it. And then it was ComSat 1's turn. And as already mentioned, ComSat 1 is on its way out to the moon, but it's doing a little bit more than just simply going to the moon. Um, you can see already that there is a satellite in orbit here. Actually, there are two. There's, there's a mapping satellite and a polar orbit. That's not the one I'm interested in. The one I'm interested in is the equatorial, the big equatorial orbit. And the satellite that's in there is JunkSat 2, which was my first communication satellite. And now I want ComSat one to join in on that and be in the same orbit but it's got to do more than just be in the same orbit eventually i want three satellites equally spaced in this orbit to com 
to give complete coverage to the moon. That means each of those satellites are going to be 120 degrees apart from each other because if you take the complete circle of 360 and divide it by 3, that's what you get, 120 degrees. So we not only have to match the orbit, we have to get it into the right location. And we'll talk a little later in the video about how we're going to accomplish that. In the meantime, the maneuver itself was only about a little less than 20 minutes away, so that gave us enough time to get on over there, perform the maneuver, uh, junk sat, oh, I'm getting my satellites mixed up, Comsat 1 will be at the moon in about five and a half hours. So uh, before we can deal with that though, I think what we best do is get ourselves over the crime before it ends up doing its atmospheric plunge. Now, I've performed this particular maneuver with this vessel before, back when I rescued Tamley. Um, same thing, uh, arrow braked into low carbon orbit and rendezvoused with a particular target. But uh, that time, I was a little less than ideally efficient, I think, in my opinion. It, it cost me about 300 meters per second to perform that maneuver, and... I'm pretty convinced I can do it more efficiently than that. I thought I did it rather sloppily. And there's a, there's a couple of things that I can do differently to make this maneuver more efficient. The first is to get my apoapsis down lower. Uh, last time I think I got my apoapsis at around 370, 380 kilometers. I need to get it lower than that. The lower, uh, closer I can get my apoapsis towards my target orbit, that's burning I don't have to do. that. I want to do as much as I can aero braking because that doesn't cost me any fuel. And I even uh, was a little bit more aggressive in tilting the vessel up in the upper part of the atmosphere. I mean at the very least this is causing uh, greater drag which will lower my apoapsis even further. But if uh, Kerbal Space Program models body lift what this is also doing is creating a downforce an aerodynamic downforce on the vessel, which will also uh, lower my apoapsis even further. And, and after this aero braking pass, I got my apoapsis down to in around 250 kilometers. I didn't think that was bad. I could have done another aero braking pass, got it down a little bit lower, but I get a little bit nervous because if I get my apoapsis if I screw up and my apoapsis enters into the atmosphere, then this vessel is in an honest-to-goodness descent, and it's going down to the surface unless I can pull it out of the atmosphere again, and I'm in a lot of trouble because this vessel is not design designed to land, uh, and uh, that would get pretty scary. So I think 250 kilometers is good enough. Then it was time to just get out to the apoapsis and uh, burn a little bit prograde, push my periapsis out of Kerbin's atmosphere to achieve a stable orbit. There we go, that's got it. So what I want to draw attention to before I actually get into the maneuver is taking a look at the Delta V up there at the top. This vessel now has 792 meters per second of Delta V. And remember what I want to do is I want to rendezvous with the space station and burn less, hopefully significantly less than 300 meters per second. And now let's get into the second thing I want to do to try and improve my efficiency, and that is to perform as much of my burn as I can at or near periapsis. So I'm going to select periapsis of my orbit. And last time I got into moving the maneuver node around, and this time I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is give myself a little bit of retrograde just to bring the orbit down, because I know I'm going to need to do that. And then I'm going to play with the plus orbit buttons that are built into precise node and move ahead some orbits until I can get my rendezvous indicators close to each other. And uh, after that, I can do a little bit of tweaking with the burn, Perhaps move it a little bit forward or a little bit backwards, but I don't want to get too far away from periapsis. And after just a little bit of playing around, I ended up with this 67 meter per second burn, which is going to occur about four and a half hours from now. That gives me enough time to pop down to the Kerbal Space Center, where Mission Control is only about 13 minutes away from upgrading to its third and final level. Yes, my first fully upgraded building of the Kerbal Space Center that's very, very exciting. And as we time warp our way to that, you might be noticing that there is a Kerstock 5 sitting on the pad, and you might be wondering, hey, Aben, why don't you launch that thing? I want to see a launch. Well, unfortunately, uh, the launch pad will not be reconditioned for almost another two and a half days. So, uh, yeah, you're going to have to wait on that one. That was that oh, big uh, space station launch. But anyway, upgrading mission control 
now removes the limitation on the number of contracts that I can have. So basically, mm -hmm. I can have as many contracts as I want, active and, well, why not? I might as well grab all of them, right? <laughs> I mean, anything that I think I might be interested in doing from now on, I am just grabbing. At the very least, it's going to be... Uh, I'm going to be getting those advances, and that's going to improve my cash flow quite considerably. Yes, upgrading mission control. Pretty useful thing to do. Anyway, back here at the Karayan, we got Bafia out here at, on EVA, as you can see. And uh, before I go and explain why she's out here on EVA, I want you to sort of take a look at her here. She comes by. Yeah, you might be noticing she looks a little different. A little bit more detailed. I was getting tired of uh, the female textures that I had downloaded. I downloaded them um, and installed them very early on when, uh, after 1.0, after Kerbal went full release. And uh, I was like, oh man, they're all starting to look the same. So I wanted to get some better textures for the girls here. And I found this diverse Kerbal glasses texture. So it looks really good. Yeah, you know, because I was honestly starting to have difficulty telling some of my female Kerbals apart. So this gives them a little bit more variety, I think. Anyway, um, as I was saying, she's out here on EVA, and the reason is is because, well, Science Alert has been stopping me while I'm time warping around in low Kerbin orbit, telling me I have an EVA to do, and I've finally had enough, and I'm going to grab that EVA, and here it is. It's Tundra. There we go. All right, science alert. You happy now? Stop bugging me and let me get back to work. After that, it was just a quick time warp to our rendezvous burn. And as we're performing this burn, I want you to take note of the little waypoint icon that's over there to above and to the left of the Karayan. That there is our space station, only about 50 kilometers away. Not that we are burning in that direction. In fact, we are burning in a direction that's pretty much perpendicular where the space station is but burning directly towards the space station that would be the wrong thing to do yes welcome to the wonderful world of orbital dynamics and it's really really interesting because as we time warp around to where our rendezvous is going to be you can see that we are getting further and further away from the space station 80 kilometers away 90 100 kilometers and then the waypoint disappears but we can still follow the distance down here thanks to Kerbal Engineer that was 115 kilometers away, but it's going to be short-lived, and there we are, we're already starting to come back down, we're getting closer to it now. Now it's 100 kilometers, and the waypoint pops back in, and of course after this it's not too much longer until we're coming in for our rendezvous. And of course we're going to dock with the space station here, and you saw me do a docking last episode, so just to do something a little different, I thought this episode I'm going to do the entire docking from IVA mode. And of course, raster prop monitor is going to help us tremendously here, and you can see that it is integrated very well with the docking alignment indicator. Okay, so we'll just have to do some time warping and some editing. We're still, wait a minute. That number's not changing. What the, what's Kerbal Engineer say? Oh shoot, my distance is increasing. Oh, I'm burning in the wrong direction. Oh my lord. Well, for trying to give a lesson on how to do things efficiently, I certainly am not doing that. So let's spin this beastie around. <sighs> and the docking alignment indicator seems to be frozen. I don't know why, but I'll have to deal with that later. Right now, let's at least get ourselves going in the right direction. I do like the sort of throttle percentage indicator that is on this nav ball screen. It's sort of down towards the bottom left of the nav ball. Because it's hard to sort of tell. There we go. Put it up to 6% throttle. Start burning. There goes our retrograde icon. And here comes our prograde icon. Yeah, it is easy to sort of lose track of what your throttle set at when you're on interior view. So having that percentage throttle is really nice. Okay, 5 meters per second, good enough. Okay, well, let's spin ourselves around again and get ready. Oh, oh, there goes the sun out the window. That's still frozen. Figure that out. But let's get ourselves pointing backwards once again so that we can be ready to slow ourselves down when needed. I'm noticing here that the reference 
the docking alignment indicator says soy green, which is the capsule that I'm in. Should be the docking port. I wonder if that's part of the issue. Well, unfortunately to change that, I can't do that from out here. So I'm gonna have to go back to the exterior view and select the docking port and go control from here, which I would have had to do anyway. Nope, nope, the docking alignments indicator is still messed up. Well, I guess I'll just open up the regular docking port indicator window and, oh, well that just unlocked it. Okay, we don't need, now it's frozen again. Okay, so I guess I have to have this open. Well, I do see a settings button there on the docking alignment window. And uh, maybe I can start playing with that, but I'm getting into about 100 meters away from the target. So I just, why don't we just put this off to the side? Well, we just, we'll just pretend this isn't here. Then I'll figure out later what's going on. There, I'll just tuck that away. There, you can't see that, right? <laughs> Anyway, so let's see here. We are closing in on the target. Remember what you want to do is you want to take this this big orange target that you see now appearing on the uh, alignment screen, and you want to put that on the white crosshairs. And what that orange target represents is your docking port or the docking port of the Korion. And when you get it right onto the white crosshairs, that's an indication that you have the two docking ports parallel to one another. Moving it around is a little bit weird. I almost feel like, oh, and then I'm doing a little bit of uh, RCS burning there, and I'll explain why I'm doing that in just a moment. But uh, I always feel like it feels a little bit backwards to me, and I actually picture moving the white crosshairs rather than moving the orange target. That's what helps me out. But anyway, the re I'm thrusting actually backwards right now because the red lines, that red axis is indicating that my docking port is actually behind the docking port of the space station. So I have to back up a bit. And that CDST is my central axis distance. I need to get that into the positives. You can see it's getting close. Just about to go positive. And when it goes positive, those that axis goes green. Goes from red to green, indicating I'm now in front of the docking port where's where I want to be. So I'm going to slow my central velocity down to zero. There we go. So that CVEL is now very close to zero with a central axis distance of five meters. So I'm now five meters ahead of the docking port, or at least the plane of my docking port is five meters ahead of the plane of the station's docking port. I'm still 50 meters away from the station, but I am moving in the right direction, and I know I'm moving in the right direction because of that retrograde icon. You want again, again, what you want to do is you want to keep that retrograde icon between the white axis in the middle and the green axis. That indicates you're moving in the right direction. That green axis where it crosses is representing the location of the station's docking port. Seven meters from the target. Just moving laterally. Oh, and now you can see the waypoint for the space station coming into view. I'm gonna assume that's gonna settle itself out somewhere in the middle, probably right in the middle of that nav ball where it's gonna end up seeing, but we don't have to look at that. We can just look at the screen here on the bottom, getting closer, six meters, and start thrusting myself forward now a little bit, increasing that central velocity. 0 0.03 meters per second. I can go a little bit faster than that towards the docking port. Got to start closing that distance, that central axis distance. All right. And you can see now the central axis distance and the actual distance distance are almost the same. And that's because I'm almost perfectly lined up. I thrust it forward just a little bit more, now approaching the docking port at 0.13 meters per second. A blistering pace. And of course, once we get in around the last meter or so, magnetic forces between the two docking ports are going to uh, take over and finish the job for us without us having to do too much. There we go. We are now pretty much all lined up. Just have to keep that all together now and keep moving my way forward. Three and a half meters to go between the docking ports. Three meters. And actually, as we close in here, I want you to take a look up at the delta V up there at the top. 
because remember I was trying to do this efficiently and right now my delta V is at 597 meters per second left in this particular vehicle and then we'll talk about how efficiently did how efficiently did I end up doing this oh we are close now one and a half meters Oh, those, those should be finishing it off for us soon. One meter away. 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6. Come on, 0 0.5. Oh, there it goes. And we are docked. There we go. All right. And as I uh, turn off the torque on the reaction wheels in the Karayan, remember that I had 597 meters per second in the Karayan just before we docked. Uh, don't look at what the delta V is now. It's all messed up because we're docked with the station. And uh, before I started this whole process, I had 792 meters per second. That means that this rendezvous cost me 195 meters per second. Last time, it cost me about 300 meters per second. So I saved about 100 meters per second. That's not so bad. Um, especially considering the fact that part of that time I was going in the wrong direction. So I probably could have saved myself even a little bit more. So I'm pretty pleased with that. That was a 50% saving just by thinking about the rendezvous in a little bit more detail. But anyway, it's time for us to leave the Karayan and head off and see how ComSat-1 is doing. So here we have ComSat-1 already in the sphere of influence of the moon. And the idea here to get into this orbit that we are now targeting in yellow, the, our, the same orbit that Junksat 2 is in, but to be 120 degrees away from Junksat 2. And notice that as we come in here, we're going to be behind Junksat 2. And as we time warp our way towards periapsis to do our capture burn, what I want to pay attention to is the phase angle. And notice that the phase angle isn't around uh, 320 degrees. Now, what the phase angle is measuring is imagine taking your two satellites or whatever your objects are and joining them to the center of the, of the uh, body of which you're going around. Okay, the moon in this case. <laughs> and measuring that angle. That's what that angle is. Now, it's negative, but that doesn't matter. It's because it's going around the other way. I won't get into that. Anyway, if I can get that angle to be 240 degrees, which is uh, two 120s, um, then I would be in a position that I want to be. I would end up being 120 degrees behind Junksat 2. So what I need to do is lose about 80 degrees of the phase angle. In order to do that, I need to go slower. And in order to go slower, I need to put myself into a p orbit with a period that is higher than the period of Junksat 2. Now, Junksat 2's orbit has a period of two days. And what I've decided to do, that's two Kerbin days or 12 hours. What I decided to do is to do half an hour longer than that. And the reason I chose half an hour is this. If you take 30 minutes and divide it by two hours, and then multiply that by 360 degrees, you get 15 degrees. What that means is this. Every orbit around, every 360 I do, I'm going to be losing about 15 degrees in my phase angle. Now remember, I want to lose about 80 degrees, so if you do a little bit divided by 15, uh, you'll see that I'll take about between 5 and 6 orbits. Each of these orbits is about 2 days. So what I did is I'm going to set my period so that it is 2 days and 30 minutes, and then I'm going to come back here in about 8 days. That's kind of well ahead of time. Again, it should take about four or five or six orbits in order for it to get into the position I want. But I do want to check in on it a little bit early so I can adjust things should I need to. But yeah, this is looking pretty good. And then what I'll do is I'll just uh, come back to this later. Oh, wait. Wait, what do we got here? That's Junksat 3. Junksat 3 was also on its way on the moon. In fact, it was the one you might recall that KSP was predicting a free capture. And it certainly looks like it's captured. So it's not supposed to be here yet. Alarm clock has it not coming here for almost a day. I don't, I don't quite know what's going on there. But uh, let's switch over to it and whoa. <laughs> let's check to see if uh, I really, if I do have this capture. So we'll go to map view. Oh, nope. <laughs> oh 
my god, KSP is so confused about this. Thing. Yeah, according to Alarm Clock, we're not supposed to be here for four hours. In four hours and three minutes, we're supposed to go into the moon's sphere of influence. We're here! <laughs> and we don't have the capture that we're supposed to have. We're close. You can see it's very close. And I was going to get into this big explanation as to how I think this might work. I actually thought I was going to get a free capture due to uh, some subtleties in the patched Conix model. But clearly that's all irrelevant now. I did not get my capture. It's not going to be much of a burn to get the capture. I can see that, say that much. Oh, wait, science alerts. Mystery goo. I got a, oh yeah, there's a mystery goo container on this. Awesome. Okay, there's nothing to transmit, but I'm going to transmit because I do have a transmit science from the moon contract. <laughs> ah, there it is. Awesome. I love it. You don't even have to transmit. I forgot I had that mystery goo on here because that was part of the requirement of the original satellite contract way back. And I got another contract for free. Awesome. All right. I love that. Anyway. The plan for this, well, is pretty much the same as it was for ComSat 1, to get it 120 degrees away from, uh, into the same orbit, but 120 degrees away from JunkSat 2, except this time we are actually ahead of JunkSat 2. And in fact, as we close in on periapsis here, according to the phase angle from Kerbal Engineer, we're about 100 degrees ahead of junk sat too. That's pretty close. I only need to be ahead about 120 degrees, but this time I need to move ahead. So I need to put um, junk sat 3 into an orbit that has a lower period than junk sat. I'm getting all my junk sats mixed up. Junk sat 2 is the one I'm comparing to. That's right. <laughs> uh, and it's in an orbit that's two days. This time though, because it only has to move ahead another 20 degrees, I'm going to make the orbit just 10 minutes less and if I do the math 10 minutes out of two days times 360 that comes out to this thing's going to be gaining about five degrees of phase angle per orbit Again, two days per orbit five degrees per orbit to gain 20 that's gonna be about four days but this guy's in a bit of a lower orbit and I do like to come in early I'm gonna come in here and check on it in about a day and a half yeah, these guys are a bit of a mess right now, but hopefully in several days they will be nicely distributed and I'll have myself a nice little communication network around the moon. The remote tech contract seems happy. It's it's convinced I have 95% of the moon covered and it's already started its countdown. It's a little bit more a little bit less than 3 days from now. It's it, that contract will hopefully be complete. But that's going to have to be for a future episode. I thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.